Try to maintain the intention to stay focused on your breath. What this means is that as distractions come up, you have a choice. You can go with the distraction or you can stay with the breath. You want to keep reminding yourself, staying with the breath is going to accomplish a lot more. The distractions may be interesting, they may be entertaining, they may insist on their importance. But you have to remind yourself you have more important work to do. You're trying to develop your powers of mindfulness, your powers of alertness. You're trying to develop your concentration. Because these powers will allow you to develop your discernment. And the discernment is what frees the mind. Frees it from all the restrictions it places on itself, all the unnecessary burdens and suffering it places on itself. So the results of staying here, much longer lasting, much more solid than whatever pleasure you might get from following your dis distractions, is that you stay with the breath. You can see your intentions a lot more clearly, and you're in a better position to act on skillful ones. And the problem is, is as you go through life, it's harder to stay focused like this. You have to keep reminding yourself of your values, so that when you catch yourself choosing something unskillful, you can pull yourself back. And among the values that we keep in mind are the sublime attitudes that we chanted just now. Goodwill, a wish for happiness, compassion, a wish that those who are suffering could put an end to their suffering, but that those who are creating the causes for suffering can stop. The empathetic joy. Wishing that those who are already happy, well off, may stay that way. And that those who are creating the causes for happiness and well being will continue in their efforts. Those first three of the sublime attitudes go together wishes for happiness apply to different circumstances. The first one is. Happiness for all beings in general. Compassion is wishing happiness for those who are suffering. Empathetic joy, wishing continued happiness for those who are already happy. Equanimity, the fourth, is something else. You may have noticed in the chat. Goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy. The phrases begin, may, may, may this happen, may they be this way. But equanimity is simply a statement of fact. People will receive the results of their actions, for good or for ill. Equanimity is the reality check for the other three. When we're dealing with people that we want to have happy, what to make happy, but we can't do it. We have to realize there are times when it's going to be beyond us. Even the Buddha couldn't help everybody in the world in the night of his awakening. He saw beings on all levels of the cosmos, and he realized that there are only some of those beings that he would be able to reach. As he said, he was the foremost teacher for those fit to be tamed. In other words, those ready to train themselves. Realizing that a lot of beings are not ready to train themselves yet. And 
And so we'd have to have equanimity for those that he could not train. So he could focus his energies on areas where it would be productive. This is why we say equanimity is the reality check. Our desire for the happiness of all living beings can be infinite, but the actual happiness that's going to be coming about as a result of our actions will be finite. We have to keep that in mind so we can focus our finite energies in the areas that would be most productive. Now, this doesn't mean we give up easily. There are going to be cases where it's going to be difficult to have compassion, difficult to have empathetic joy. When there are people you know have been acting in unskillful ways and now reaping the results of their unskillful actions, suffering. You still have to have compassion for them. You can't simply say, well, they deserve what they got. Because some people do have the potential to get out of that suffering. That teaching on equanimity doesn't say that people suffer because they've done something that makes them deserve to suffer. Simply they have some actions in their past that lead to suffering, but they may have lots of actions that lead to the opposite, lead to happiness, which may not be showing the results yet, but maybe if you give that person some help, those good actions may start showing their results. Sometimes the teaching on karma is said to be hard-hearted. You see somebody suffering and people think that karma says, well, they simply deserve to suffer, so leave them be. That's not the case. Karma is complex. Think about all the many actions you do in the course of the day, all the different intentions and choices that you act on. You're creating all kinds of karma all the time, and everybody is creating all kinds of karma all the time. So when you see somebody suffering, even though you know they've been doing unskillful things, you hold them and maybe they have some skillful potential. It's only when you try to help and run into obstacles you may decide that this person is beyond me. And that's where you develop equanimity. Empathetic joy can be difficult at times as well. Somebody has a happiness that you would like to have, but you don't have. Empathetic joy means that you're not jealous, you're not envious. You don't resent their happiness. After all, here you're saying that may all beings be happy. And then when somebody actually is happy, you don't like it. Empathetic joy is a test for the honesty of your goodwill. Of course, there are people who are happy and well off and behaving in unskillful ways. So you have to develop a double attitude. Compassion for their lack of skill. Empathetic joy for the results of their past good actions. And that can also be chastening. Here you are, seeing an example of someone who did good things at some point in the past and is reaping the results of those good things, but has now become unskillful. It should make you stop and think about your own self. You're trying to create the causes for happiness, but the happiness hasn't reached a noble level. In other words, your discernment hasn't freed you from a lot of the things that keep the mind trapped and fettered. Even happiness doesn't protect you from starting to be unskillful again. It's chastening, this thought. It's a good motivation to want to focus your efforts on developing something more noble, more solid, more reliable.
when you try developing compassion, try developing empathetic joy. And you reach cases where you can't help the other person. Either to become happy or to maintain happiness. That's when you have to have equanimity. You say this is the equanimity of a good doctor. Who realizes that he can't solve all the cases in the world. But if he lets his heart get broken over all the cases he can't solve, then the cases he might have been able to solve, he doesn't have the ener energy to help these people. So for the people who come to him and have the karma that, that allows him to help, and he has the karma that allows him to help them. Think of that as an opportunity. It's not always there. So make the most of it. And don't let yourself get distracted by things that you can't control, or you can't be of help. Because as I said, karma is complex. The combination of the patient's karma to be in a position where he or she can be cured, and the doctor's karma connection with that patient It doesn't always happen that these things are in alignment. So when you find that they are, focus your energies there. And don't get frustrated by the cases where your karma is not in alignment at that time. It may happen that sometime later things line up. Where that for the for that particular patient, the karma alignment has to to involve another doctor. This is a sign of wisdom among, a doc among doctors. This is when a doctor has a patient and he knows that he's not the doctor for that patient. Maybe somebody else is. That encourages a certain amount of humility. It's all the better part of wisdom. Because that's what equanimity is in the Brahma Viharas. It's the voice of wisdom. It keeps reminding you that you have to understand your karma, you have to understand the karma of others. Realizing in both cases it's quite complex. And you can't let simplistic emotions get in the way of making the most of your karmic opportunities. As when the Buddha taught karma, it has nothing to do with the popular conception where karma is bad karma, bad fate coming to you. The Buddha taught karma is the power that we have here in the present moment to shape our lives. and to take advantage of the opportunities to come our way to do something really skillful with our abilities. We do make choices. We are responsible for the choices. So we live in a world where our lives have meaning. If we couldn't make choices, if we'd be just like machines, or if everything were preordained, predetermined, we'd be like machines. Life would have no meaning at all, just as the running of a machine has no meaning. But the fact that we can make choices, and their choices have consequences, they shape our world, they shape our lives, they make a difference. That gives meaning to our lives. It offers us the possibility to give as much meaning to our lives as we can. We are the people who decide what does our lives mean? What do our lives mean? What are we alive for? That's the wisdom that lies behind equanimity. Equanimity is not simply indifference.
It's an acceptance of our responsibilities, an acceptance of some limitations on our abilities. But it's not meant to stop there. It's when we accept our limitations that we sometimes can find our way around them, or at the very least make the most of our opportunities. That's why the Buddha taught karma in particular, and that's why he taught in general. People can change themselves, they can change the world. Even if it's within limits, those changes are meaningful. This is why we meditate to give ourselves the wisdom and the strength and the clarity of insight. So that we can make the best use of that power 